Welcome back to another episode of Six Picks Music Club, a music podcast for people who rewatch movies with the director commentary on. Well, hey, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us again this episode of Six Picks Music Club. We are really excited to have you here today. We've got some special stuff in store. And as always, I'm Dave. And with me, we have Jeffro. Hey, hey, hey. And Russ. Good evening. And every week we pick six songs around a central theme. You know, before we get too crazy and get started with the thing, we've got to get this clubhouse open. We got to get the doors unlocked. So we need the password. Jeffro, what's the password this week? Don't call me Fun Bobby. (laughs) (laughs) Don't call me Fun Bobby. Let's check it. Let's, uh, it's an older password, but it it checks out. That's right. Okay, we're going to get in there. Come on in the doors, everybody. Hey, listener, what's up? This week, you are in for a treat because as Jeffro was kind of alluding to in the password, something that's kind of become a little bit of a theme. We'll see if that continues. We have a special guest today. Joining us from 5280, the great city of Denver in the colorful Colorado, we have our good friend, Bobby. Boys, thank you so much for having me on. It's been, I don't know, at least a one week dream to be a part of this (laughs) and to get invited is, I'm going to be honest, it's a lot. It's a lot to handle. If it sounds like I'm nervous, I'm not. I'm just, I'm scared. It's more scary. (laughs) <laughs> we are not very good at this, and that's okay. We're excited to have you and uh... speak for yourself. Oh, Jeff, I've listened. I've listened. It, it's all of you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's why we're calling in the big guns, right? Yeah, it was the same thing. A bunch of lice called me in to <laughs> help them out about some uh, Toronto deal. I don't really know what that's about, but they want a big gun to come in, help them with that situation. So here I am trying to be a part of it. Bobby's going to be one of our pickers. Russ is sitting out our topic this week, and our topic is going to be one hit wonders of the 70s. We've each got two. I think they're pretty fun. I hope you do too. But we thought we would take a minute just to kind of introduce Bobby to you all. We've known him for a long time but he might be new to you. Jeff, how are we going to introduce Bobby to the listener? I thought we're not going to sit here and do each other's biographies. How boring. It's, it'd be like an Adam Driver movie if we did that. <laughs> so instead, we're going to play a little game. It's called Best Worst. I have a list here of best worst topics, and the idea is I would like to try to identify who of the three of us is the best at something and at the worst at that same thing, and then we'll discuss. Does that sound good? Does everybody understand? That's reasonable. I think I got it. So I'll start. Who's best and who's worst at urinating for distance? Like if we lined up. (laughs) I'm going to say, boys, I can tell you already I am the best at that. Are you? I can push with arc. It's a superpower of mine. I think just... As gross as this is, just bathroom in general, powerful. The real takeaway is that Bobby does a lot of work on his core, and I think that really aids in his velocity. I have this other thing that happens now that I double pee. I pee, and I oh. feel like I've I'm, I've drained it, and then I brush my teeth, and then I have to pee again. A double pee. What's yeah, that? Yeah, you should see it. Is my prostate? That's a UTI. Yeah, you <laughs> need to see a doctor. <laughs> you should go to the doctor. <laughs> who's best and who's worst at wrestling? <laughs> I'm going to be the worst. <laughs> You're just so kind-hearted. You can't even choke somebody out for a cheap win. <laughs> I mean, I feel like if I had an opportunity, maybe it's with you, but I think your cabbage patch legs would just overtake me and I would be done. (laughs) That's what you do have to contend. I have a low center of gravity. Uh, So this is a really tough one because like Bobby is unstoppable. You will not wear him out. He will go and whoop you into submission. It doesn't matter if you've got him pinned with your ass crack in his nose. He's going to find a way to wear you down and then sack your face that's gonna be how it ends and jeff you've got so much power a lot of thickness yeah given the opportunity to apply that power it's equally unstoppable we've all had some pretty serious showdowns there was a slap fight that dave and i got into in the back of i think it was my mustang while somebody else was driving it yeah bobby turns around (laughs) guys Be cool. You're not being, we're friends, guys. Come on. (laughs) Bobby, you and I got in a showdown in the same city on the stoop of your home that I'm pretty sure you bought for $1,500 or something like that. 
It was like three in the morning and we were both drunk. Suddenly we got wild eyes at each other and it was a little scrape. And Bobby wrapped me up into a headlock where I was facing backwards and DDT'd me on concrete. <laughs> oh, no. It was like dropping a laptop on the ground. There was suddenly like like the power went out on the screen and it came back on the screen. And when the power came back on the screen, I jumped up. Ah, 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 and he was like, dude, 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 dude. <laughs> I'm sorry, bro. Here's the question. Have the two of you ever had a showdown, Dave and Bob? No. No. Not physical. I know that we're advancing in age, but that has to happen for us to know the answer to this. You guys have. Let's do it on our 50th or my 50th birthday. I'll get there before you. Let's let's do it. Then. Sure. <laughs> who is the best and who is the worst at interacting with servers? I'm just going to straight up and come out. I am polarizing in that <laughs> way. I think I could probably hit both sides of that. Because I'm a kind, caring man, but at the same time, it can be a little relentless. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Lots of talking to the server. It can be overwhelming. Right? Not, they're not going to easily get away. I feel like I'm okay with servers, but probably not as good as Dave. I think Dave is such an empathetic human, and so he's relating to them. I just stare at their feet and mumble. <laughs> you do what my mother-in-law does, basically. <laughs> One time they go, how would you like your eggs prepared? And she said, well done, my mother-in-law. <laughs> well done, eggs. <laughs> Because you were born in the 1970s. hey -oh. And that's why on your first guest app, we're doing One Hit Wonders from the 1970s. Are we ready to do this? Give us the breakdown. What, what defines One Hit Wonder? How did we come up with the songs? What were the criteria? First off, I just want to say it's seen to be a derogatory thing, but I don't really think of it as a derogatory thing. I think it's perfectly fine to be a One Hit Wonder. And part of it is that yeah, so you didn't pump out a lot of number one hits. A lot of one-hit wonder bands wrote their own song, and it's a song that everybody in the world listened to for a second. That's a particularly special thing. And before the internet, it was like a meme. It was like something that went viral. And to achieve virality in the old days, if you were unknown, is pretty awesome. And so I like one-hit wonders, and I think they're cool. But the rules are... First off, everybody has to know the song. So if you're trying to argue that somebody's a one-hit wonder and nobody knows the song, like there, there are lists of these. And one of them is a song by Poco. Do you know that song? No, you don't know who Poco is. So it doesn't count. I've got it on vinyl, you dick. <laughs> oh my God, of course you have Poco on vinyl. Does it need to be a number one hit or just needs to be in the top 10? That's a good question, Russ. And thank you for asking it. But no, it has to be up there and everybody now has to still know the song. Not all songs that are great one hit wonders did achieve number one success. But here are some pieces of it. The artist and the song are inseparable from each other. So that's one feature of one hit wonder. The song is universal. Everybody knows it. And there are a lot of other little bylaws, but the final rules, if you're judging by listens to say, does it count as a one hit wonder if they had other hits that were that are listened to? If the top dog in their catalog is listened to eight times as much or more as the second song, it could still qualify as a one hit wonder. What number are you looking at here? I'm talking about streaming numbers. Okay. So those are the rules based on this. We can choose one hit wonders across the history of music, but we've chosen the 70s here. And I think in the future, if everyone else will allow it and listener will put up with it, we will do the other decades as well. Not all in order, but over time. Awesome. I love all these tracks today. This is a fun list. And I'm going to start the ball down this hill. Is that what people say? They say, I'm going to start the ball. Get the ball rolling. They say that. Yeah, they say that. But they don't say, I'm going to start the ball. Down the hill. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this band was formed in 1970 by Leslie West and Felix Papalardi. They started as a duo and then added other people to their band as they started to record. And the band is Mountain. And the song off of their first album, Climbing, that I picked for my first 70s one hit wonder is Mississippi Queen. This song climaxes immediately. <laughs> I love this fucking song. Yeah, it's a great one. God, that song 
fucking rocks. That is a banger. What it does is it throws you down on the bed and then just, it just <laughs> immediately starts going. There's no foreplay in the <laughs> song. It just goes right into the guitar lick. <laughs> Yeah, but and probably the second most famous uh, cowbell of this era, just behind oh, that yeah. Blue Oyster Cult, Don't Fear the Reaper. It takes no prisoners. And it's funny because the drummer who wasn't the drummer with them at the time, he was at a party. They were playing a show. Corky Lang. Corky Lang. Yeah. And he was horny playing a show. All the power went out at the show. So the band didn't have uh, power for their instruments. But like some dude brought this really hot lady and she was wearing a see through dress at the show. And he was like, I got to keep this girl dancing. So he like he grabs the cowbell, does an impromptu drum solo and just starts screaming the refrain for like an hour the whole way. He screams so loud and so long. He gave himself chronic laryngitis and fucked his voice forever. Ugh. And that's how this song started. It was his voices going out song. Yeah. It was this voices was... swan song. <laughs> if we could just back it up for a second. Corky has disappeared as a name, <laughs> and that's really just too bad. There need to be more Corkies in the world. Yeah. It was that show in the 80s that killed it, dude. Life goes yeah. on. Life goes on. After that show, nobody named their kid Corky. <laughs> so, yeah, Leslie West and Felix Papalardi, they met each other because uh, Felix was a producer, and he'd produced uh, a, a record for Leslie's previous band, The Vagrants. And so Leslie liked Felix because he'd worked uh, and produced a couple of Cream records, and West really was big on how Clapton play guitar. Yeah, it's definitely four white guys from New York singing about the <laughs> Mississippi Queen. Here's a question I do have, though. He goes, Mississippi Queen, if you know what I mean. I, I yeah. really, honestly, I don't know what you mean. I think there's something to just saying, what does it take to be a queen of Mississippi versus what it means to be a New York queen? Like, I, I, I read something like that into that. He's like calling your white trash? <laughs> 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 but it's also kind of a story about a guy who's like fallen in love with a sex girl at a party and then like he's he doesn't have any money because he spends it all buying her shiny dresses. So it's like... I'll tell you a couple other things I love about this song. It doesn't last long. <laughs> Your wife complains about the same thing. <laughs> We're under three minutes. We just come in and rock your fucking right. face off and see you around. And it also ends. It just, yeah. no, there's no fade out. There's something to that song that I would say, I'm not saying grunge came from there, but it is dirty. Like, it's yeah. not a real yeah. play. It's a, like, it gets grungy. So Leslie West, he was childhood heroes of Eddie Van Halen and Slash and Joe Satriani. The band Mountain is very often credited as being one of those bands who heavily influenced the development of heavy metal music. You're 100% on there. It starts with this fuzzy bass and like his vocal scream there at the end is just like, it's it's pretty rock and roll. That's something in there about just the one hit wonder, right? To the masses, whereas yeah. musicians yeah. probably heard that song first, maybe introduced to it and then said, good God, these guys fucking rock. Let's get into the rest of it and then found other gems, whereas the masses weren't fed the rest of their music and so I had no idea. They ended up, not lasting very long as a band because they had such success off of this. Their third live performance they played together was the nine o'clock show on Saturday of Woodstock. That was the third time they played together as a band. Whoa. And they destroyed it. Yeah. Mountain seems like you just drive the Camaro, you're doing blow, you're smoking cigarettes, and you just drive it right off the fucking cliff to this song. And that's what they were as a band. They ended up breaking up in 1972, citing a combination of drug abuse, <laughs> <laughs> engaged in a very hectic tour. And then uh, Felix actually had a, a hearing thing that was messing with them because the shows were so loud. They were like known as a louder version of Cream. Shit, yeah. Last thing, like Felix was shot dead by his wife uh, in 1983. Of course he was. Dude, all of this checks out. Everything <laughs> about the story makes sense. How long after after kind of their greatness or the one hit wonder was he shot down. It was 1983, 10 years later. He'd given her that gun as a gift a couple of months before, and then she killed him with it. Do you know Leslie West was in uh, Mississippi in 2011? 
and he played a show and then his right leg started swelling and he had to go to the hospital and they cut it off at the knee. And he's like, Jesus Christ, of all places, lose my leg is fucking Mississippi. <laughs> Did that really happen? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He had like diabetes complications. It's crazy. Yeah. He had the sugar foot. You got to cut that sugar <laughs> foot right off, dude. <laughs> you got- <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Hey, I need a I need a check on that. Is, is Sugarfoot gonna? Yeah, we're gonna have to run a check on Sugarfoot. We're gonna have to run that through our focus groups and see what the response is. I will tell you, Dave, that is a fucking jam right there. That is a rock song. Yeah, that's a great pick. All right, transition from going down from the mountain down into kind of the mud and then getting stuck in things. We got a band formed in 1972 by Joe Egan and Jerry Rafferty, who met at the same Catholic high school in Paisley, Scotland. The band is Steeler's Wheel, and this song is Stuck in the Middle with You off of their debut album, Steeler's Wheel. This song predated, I think, Jerry Rafferty's Baker Street, right? It sure did. They did two albums, I think, before City to City came out. Okay, because it doesn't get to be like if Jerry Rafferty had a hit song before he was in this band and had a different hit. But even if it was that band's only hit, it's not a one hit wonder anymore. It's a dq -er. I think she passed the test. This song stands up as a one hit wonder and how unlikely that it was. Like the song they kind of wrote as a parody of a Bob Dylan song because the studio wanted them to make a record that sounded like a Bob Dylan song. And they just nailed it. They went in and they nailed it. It's not every time that you have a song where you start with one instrument and then the next instrument comes in just perfectly. And the beginning of that song, it just happens and you are in a groove. And it's great. It got in front of the right people and it became this song that, that really blew up. The thing that's that I think is great about the song is that it's this fun, positive, happy melody. But then the lyrics are talking about something that's this totally disillusioned space, which is where Rafferty was. Because after he left his first band and before they started Steeler's Wheel, he put out a solo record, put out a bunch of singles. And so now he's recorded and released singles, commercial failure, and he's just starting to get disillusioned with the recording industry. And so he's 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 written this song about being at a, a record producer's cocktail party. And it's this satirical take on like being out of place and having to socialize all these people that aren't your friends. And they're all crawling up to you, slap you on the back and say, please, everybody wants something. And it's just like, he's sick of it. And he's like, if I don't ever do anything with this and I fail and I sleep on the floor, should I walk away? That idea of you're the people I got to fucking deal with. I got jokers all around me and I'm stuck in the middle with you people that are going to try to tell me what's up and how to do it and blah, blah, blah. And I did it from nothing. I did it on my own. Like I'm a self-made man. And now you're going to take it from me. Yeah, that's right. Interesting enough, the producers did fuck them in the end out of a bunch of money, and there was this big lawsuit that went on for three years. No way. Yeah. Oh, weird. <laughs> the evil <laughs> studio didn't pay the artist? <laughs> Dang. Contracts are fun. Yeah, while they were working all that out, like neither Egan or Rafferty could put out music. And, you know, Egan would do two more records before he left the business in 1981. And then uh, Rafferty would go on to chart other hits with Baker Street. That's just his biggest hit of all time. Well, so and Rafferty was like pissed about all of this. And like he left the band before the single even came out. They released two other singles off, off this record first in the fall of 72 and neither one of them charted or did anything and so there wasn't a lot of commercial success with it but then it was april that they released this and in between then jerry rafferty was like this sucks i don't want to be in this band anymore and he left the band and then the song got huge and they're like hey you should come back and tour and he was like yeah okay i, I will <laughs> he's like i do want to be in the band i really like both these songs and they both actually have a, a nice little cowbell in there maybe that's the theme running through mine is it's definitely gotta gotta have that cowbell to be a one-hit wonder we'll see if it works out but next up we are gonna let our guest of the epi mr bobby take pick number three and four tonight so the first song I'm bringing to the table is in 1970. So the beginning of the decade, right? And I wanted to do a touch of a dichotomy of from the beginning to the end. Now, obviously, in the beginning of the 70s, disco wasn't a thing yet. So the first band I'm bringing to the table tonight is The Five Stair Steps. These are five brothers, all of the same family, of course, same mother, no father in the scene. And the mother was... 
dubbed by their friends as Mama Stair Step because of the five kids they literally looked when lined up side by side like a stair step, which is pretty cool way of doing. Now, I'm one of five kids, just to put that out there. So I think the five kids bit is cool. This is a band formed in Chicago in 1965. And they tooled around, did some small shows, did a lot of nothing until in the very beginning of 1970, they came out with the hit, Ooh Child. Ooh Child, what I like about it is this is R&B, but it comes with a flavor of both. So this is a black family, of course, and in Chicago in 1969 into the 70s, Obviously, our race relations were pretty fucking shit, and they would go through hell. And this song comes out with such a beautiful idea of this won't last. So whether you're muddling through the bullshit of your everyday life or if you're muddling through absolute bullshit racism and garbage, this song talks about hope and future for down the road. Yeah. So it's got that classic 70s fade out, right, which really was they kind of didn't know how to kill songs back in the day. But, <laughs> but what I love about it is it's such an idea of hope. There are very few individual lyrics in the song, a ton of repetition about it will get brighter. Someday we'll walk in the rays of the beautiful sun. The idea of hope through, I think it both holds to a very dark time that we had with kind of oppression and shit like that. But also combined with just anybody can relate to the song when you're in the throes of bullshit, whether it's relationship, whatever. The idea that the sun fucking shines. It's easier to write songs, hit songs about depression, about feeling down in the dumps, having the blues, being broken up with. Angst. Angst. It's harder to write good, positive songs that everybody wants a little piece of. It's a special thing. It's so catchy. It's so inviting. Like, I, I can't imagine someone turning this song off when it comes up on the radio. And I think one way you can talk about something being hit is you talk about covers. Oh, God. This song was covered by dozens of people from Hall and Oates. So many. Janet Jackson, Nina Simone, Dusty Springfield. These are monster fucking artists covering the song. And this song was covered four months after it was put out. It's one of those songs that makes you feel like no matter how dirty the grind, no matter how muddy it is out there, that sun does really shine the next day. And I, I've been through hell. Who hasn't? We've all been through the garbage. But that's a song you can put on and really feel positive about. And there's something glorious to that. One of the things I love about it is that it, the way that it's sampled in hip hop, there is such an attachment to the feeling you get from this song that like when Tupac puts it into his song, it's really poignant. There's so many great samples where this song just sets a tone, sets a mood. Everyone can hear this and feel something positive. All right. So for my second one hit wonder from the seventies that I'm bringing, I'm going to take it to the end of the decade. And we're going to bring up a song called I love the nightlife parentheses put in disco round, which is probably the common word that you'll remember from this. By Alicia Bridges, Bring the Heat. This was a woman who did not do disco. This was not her thing. Alicia Bridges was not a disco singer, but she wanted to do a disco album about partying. This is about a woman who's with a man who's sleeping around, getting all around town, and she doesn't want to hear about love tonight. She doesn't want to hear about what you think of me. She wants to boogie. She wants to get down. I love the line of action. I got so much to give. I want to give it. I want to get it. A fucking powerful thing for a woman in the late 70s to say, I know you're all over it. I want it too. And I just picture the producer in the studio going, it's great, but we're going to need 
more stank on that action. <laughs> and she's, okay, so I'll try it again. Action. And he's like, no. <laughs> more stank. More stank. And she's like, action. More stank. Like, action. Perfect. <laughs> I mean, he's nailed it. What I like about this is women empowerment. The idea that I'm not going to settle with what you want to do because another line is you can't love them all. When you're through, maybe that will make a man out of you. She's talking to whoever she's with at this time saying, you go out there and you get it. You go do it. Like in a lot of relationships, there's the male desire to domesticate wife. And once wife is domesticated, then they're like, this is boring. And then they go back out and they go find the other party girls. But their wife has always been the party person and she wants to keep partying. And so she doesn't want to just stay at home. Fuck that. That's what the song's about. It's like, I can go on the disco just like anybody else can, you turds. And this song charted number two on the U.S. Billboard of Top 100 at the time in 1978. It was number two. Here's an interesting streaming factoid. On Spotify, the top five songs are all the same song, ranging from 200,000 listens to 16 million, or almost 17 million. All just the different version or whatever of the same exact song. And then number six is a different song, but it only has 50,000. <laughs> and that's like the, the next highest song. That's a true one-hit wonder lineup right there. Yeah, and for our Swifty audience, this one predates her uh, If I Was The Man song, but it has a very similar thing, like... Why do dudes get to go out and have sex with whoever they want and ladies have to sit home and take it? Nah, not for Alicia Bridges. That's awesome. Well, hell yeah, man. I think we can officially say for your first go, those are great picks. That brings us to Jeffro. Ushering in the disco-soaked era of the 1970s is a song from 1975 by the band Hot Chocolate. And the song is You Sexy Thing. This is maybe a controversial pick for anybody that was alive in the 1970s in Britain because Hot Chocolate did have some other hits. In fact, they had hits that were on the British charts in every year between 1970 and 1980. Now you might say, Jeff, <laughs> come on, guy. This is not a one-hit wonder. Weren't you the one who told us all the rules at the beginning? I thought you were a rule guy. I am a rule guy. What I'm saying is you don't know any of those other songs, and nobody does. But everybody <laughs> knows You Sexy Thing. Everybody believes in miracles. This is a great song by a band that Cream called Sublime and Strange Greats who excelled at morally complex jams. They were immigrants to London from Jamaica and Trinidad. And you could tell that they just ooze talent. There's strings in it. There's like a sweet bass line. Everything really gels in the song. This song itself is arranged really well. They had this hit song all of a sudden that everybody knew. Everybody else loved Stevie Wonder. And somebody was like, hey, come backstage and you can meet Stevie. And he was like, holy shit. And so he goes backstage and uh, they were like, Stevie, this is Errol Brown. And he goes, oh, I know who this is. You're from the band Hot Chocolate. And then Stevie Wonder was like, I believe in miracles. He goes, you guys are a great <laughs> band. And then Errol Brown was like, it was all that I ever wanted to hear in the whole world. That was the tip top for me. So he's a real humble guy, cool guy. And I just think this song is also like a happy, hopeful song. Nobody has ever been depressed listening to the song. Like, it's you just can't do it. And it's about celebrating, like, getting to be intimate with somebody that you're excited about. You outkicked your coverage a little bit. You outkicked your coverage. You're like, oh, shit, this is really going to happen. Oh, man. Yeah, you wake up and you're just looking at him and you're like... <laughs> I believe in miracles. Yeah. And I there's one line that really cracks me up. He says it like three times, but you're lying next to me, giving it to me, which is like a specific <laughs> position because to be lying down and giving it to somebody, you have to be kind of spooning. You have to be like doing, you know, you're behind them or whatever. This is definitely forking. It's definitely forking. It's complex, really. Like the song. Maybe it's more like uh, like nooning. You get like a, a a knife and a spoon, so you're nooning. <laughs> not really, you're not really sporking, but you're nooning. What do you think? Yeah, except the spoon is giving it to the knife. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't. Know. <laughs> I lost that one at the station. 
<laughs> the other thing that Cream explored in this 2022 article about him is that Hot Chocolate did have all, like hits. Nobody knows any of them except for this one. And it doesn't make sense that nobody was writing about this band. There are no articles mm. about Hot Chocolate. Nobody talks about them. No, there was no myth around them. There was no larger than life quality to Hot Chocolate. And it could be. I have a theory uh, it's sometimes about this, but it's that their name is too stupid. Like their name. Yeah. <laughs> this is a terrible name. I was thinking, I think a lot of it has to do with the name. Yeah. They could have named it Brown and Wilson, honestly, like their last names and it would have been better. People would be like, have you heard Brown and Wilson? Those guys jam, but nobody goes like hot chocolate with marshmallows, bro. Like it just is so dumb. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is. It is almost an immature name. It doesn't draw you in to see their talent. There's something to that. This song stands on its own. But again, until we were doing this exercise through this week, I couldn't have told you who sang it. I certainly wouldn't have guessed fucking hot chocolate. Yeah. And it's too bad because I think that it's a great song. It's a great song. And these guys almost deserve more than they got. No, you're right. This is one of those songs that I can't imagine changing the station. If you were just listening to the radio, right? It's just on. Yeah. If this song comes on, you turn it up. You don't turn it off. Do you see that this song was in the UK top 10 in the 70s, 80s, and 90s? The only other song to do that was Imagine by John Lennon. That's incredible. I didn't realize that, but they also got famous by covering a John Lennon song. Yeah. They covered John Lennon. That's how they're not famous, but they got on the radar that way. Uh huh. So now let's take it into the last one a little number by a man named Rupert Holmes, who's credited as a British American composer, singer, songwriter, dramatist, and author. The man wrote plays and musicals more specifically, and he does have Tony Awards, but he's also got a one-hit wonder, Escape, or as you all know it, the Pina Colada song. If you pair this together with Bobby's choice in the Alicia Bridges song, this is a woman that has been driven into routine by her relationship, and she's looking to step out and get back on that disco and dance and have a good time again. She puts a message out into the world that says, these are the things that I like. I like pina coladas. I like making love at midnight in the dunes of the Cape, which does sound awesome. But write to me and escape. So she's doing this on the sly. She's got to get out of this routine. They've fallen into boredom. Yeah, she's trapped. She's trapped. And then he's feeling the same thing. And what's great and touching about the song is that through their mutual infidelity, they rediscover love for one another. How cool is that? You can tell that the man is also a playwright because this is a full-on story. Do you know, though, that the first line, if you like Pina Coladas. Do you know what his first real line was? Was if you like Humphrey Bogart. If you like Humphrey <laughs> Bogart. Isn't that funny? Yeah, so it doesn't work at all. And he must have obviously realized that. But it just, if you like Humphrey <laughs> Bogart. Yeah, if this was the Humphrey uh, yeah. Bogart song, <laughs> it'd be garbage. The other thing about it is that it doesn't work in the, like, meter-wise. If you like Humphrey Bogart, like that, it has to have three syllables on that second word, five total syllables. I have a little bit of, like, a, a contrary opinion, though. I'm curious what you think about this take. So... The song is called Escape, right? And I don't think they get back together at the end. I think that they escape one another in the end. They This is the breakup song. How do you get that from the song? Because she just laughs for a moment. Oh, yeah. And then she's like, oh, I laugh for a moment. Okay, but you're still you, and I still don't like you. And like... Yeah, we're still bored. No, David, there's absolutely something to it. And I know you love pina coladas, and you love getting caught in the rain, but dude, it's not you anymore yeah but it ends amicably that's cool i also love the line that he when he writes back and let's cut through all this red tape that's a great <laughs> and then it rhymes with escape perfect i don't know boys i'm not married you boys all three of you are married yes you gotta understand there's red tape there's just the nonsense of everyday life the accumulation of regular boring 
just overwhelming nothing. The challenge with the relationships is that you have to have normal interactions like on a you have to plan together your secretaries for each other you do all this other stuff you got to coordinate a ton but you also have to figure out how to still have fun and party together at some point somehow caught in the rain with her once in a while then yeah what the fuck's the point we're exactly doing the boring ant life yeah you got to keep it fun. That's a good note to end with because that's what the 70s were about. It was about we're having an energy crisis, but we're partying, guys. <laughs> that's it. In a nutshell. There's no gas, but let's get fucked up. Here we go. <laughs> Son of Sam's out there mowing people down with his revolver because his dog told him to, but we're going to go dancing. There's no gas, and the guy's jacket says, ask gas or grass, no one writes for free, so you only have two choices. <laughs> this was so fun, Bobby. You're going to have to come back and party with us again. I will say purely, this is fun. This is a beautiful thing to be able to hang out with you guys again, to talk about music. Part of the ethos of the Six Picks Music Club, we just don't listen to songs and talk about them anymore. Isn't that weird? Like, when does that happen? It happens with like teenagers and cars, but we're not teenagers in cars. Okay, it's perfectly acceptable to have a book club. People have book clubs. Let's get together and talk about chapter seven. Absolutely. I read books by myself, and I I enjoy that. But music club, get together. You're supposed to listen to music with other people. God damn it. Let's dive into the uh, to the FAHQ. We are freaked, amped, and hyped for these tracks. New songs in our playlist, and we're going to queue them up. You can link that from the show notes, and that is going to be our fa queue. And the song that is in my playlist this week is the new Black Keys song off of their upcoming album that they've done with Danny Automator and Beck. It's great. So if you haven't heard that one, go find it. A song I can't stop listening to is... The rapper Trueno, I think is how you say it, or Trueno. He's an Argentine rapper okay. that has remade Fuck the Police, and it's cleverly titled Fuck El Police, <laughs> but it's Trueno starring Cypress Hill, and it ah. fucking rules, dude. <laughs> Just check that out, Trueno. Awesome. Bobby, you got a gem to leave us with? Boys, one of these songs that I got for you is Anna Tijo which is T-I-J-O-U-X. And the song is 1977. She, of course, says it a little bit quicker than me, but it's 1977. And it is a fucking Argentinian rap rock artist. She's a badass. Check it out. All right. Yeah. Hell yeah. That was that was a blast. Uh, I love all these songs. You guys continue to be great musical backboards for me to throw ideas at. And uh, I always love hearing your thoughts on stuff. Thank you, listener, for joining us. Uh, Please like and subscribe. Leave us a comment on the YouTube thing. If you've got ideas about other one hit wonders from the 70s that we didn't talk about, or you can write in to our email that's on our website at sixpixmusic.club be sure to stay by the channel come back and check us out until then you guys keep jamming this episode of six picks music club was produced by lou skunt (laughs) (laughs) edited by hugh janus (laughs) with special thanks as always to dixie wrecked